Hey everybody, welcome back to the Frugal Filmmaker Q&A. It's the show where you send me a filmmaking question and I try to answer it. Remember, if you'd like your question read on the show, to send me an email to thefrugalfilmmaker at gmail.com or you can comment below or you can send me a message on Twitter at frugalfilmmaker. My video last week was my first technique video where I talk about specific filmmaking techniques. And this first one was about camera panning and tilting, which I realize is a super basic camera move, but it's also a very important one and I share my feelings about it as well as give examples for my own short films and in fact a comment on that video was from Matthew Gibson who said what tripod do you have in that video I actually held up a tripod which I think is the one Matthew's referring to and this is a Bogan 501 fluid head on Manfrotto 3046 sticks and this is my heavy duty tripod it's a monster I've had it for 15 years now and it's pretty durable but it's also very heavy but it's very sturdy great for high shots as well it's got a center column that extends if I extended all the legs on this thing it would probably take me to about nine feet very, very tall. Um, no bowl adjustment, however, but it's been pretty good, treated me pretty well, but I have to have something to lug it around in because I'm not going to carry it everywhere. The tripod that I'm actually shooting this video with right now has a Velbon fluid head, which I mentioned in the video and left a link to in that video, on just some kind of generic sticks. I would actually like to have something else maybe that was a little more in between, uh, but those are the two that I'm using right now and they've both served me pretty well. All right, our next question also comes from YouTube from Brendan's Fabulous World of Fishing. And he says, I have a Lumix G6 Micro Four Thirds camera and I'm going to shoot a wedding soon. I was wondering if I, if I knew of a good long fast lens that is fairly cheap. Well, if you want a cheap lens, you're going to have to go the vintage route because any lens that's built for your camera that's of any long focal length is going to be more expensive. And vintage lenses are good. I really like vintage lenses. Um, I use a lot of Minolta lenses myself. And if you want to get... A vintage lens and put it on your digital camera you need some kind of adapter so for example if you wanted to get a Minolta lens on your camera you could just go to eBay or Amazon and look up Panasonic to Minolta adapter Panasonic to Nikon adapter uh, whatever they'll all kinds of uh, adapters will come up they're usually about ten dollars not too expensive um, and these are a couple of lenses I can recommend for you you wanted something that was uh, fairly cheap both of these lenses are pretty inexpensive this is a Vivitar series one uh, 70 to 210 millimeter with a Minolta mount. It's an f3.5, which isn't super fast, but you're always going to have to sacrifice uh, some speed for the longer focal lengths, typically, um, especially if you're dealing with a zoom here. And this has a consistent aperture, however, which means that no matter what your focal length is, it's still going to be the same aperture setting, whichever one you want. It's fast. This is 3.5. Um, one thing you have to watch out about the Vivitar Series 1s, however, is you have to do a lot of homework and know your serial numbers because there's all kinds of these. Some are good, some are bad. I did a lot of homework. This lens cost me, I believe, around $50. Usually you usually can find them between $40 and $80. I can't remember exactly how much I paid for this lens, but I like it a lot. But it is a manual uh, lens, of course, so it's not going to interface with your camera. You're not going to be able to do autofocus. You just, everything's manual, so you got to be aware of that. Um, this lens right here is a Minolta Celtic uh, 135 millimeter. It's a prime. So it's a little bit sharper, a little bit nicer. This is really inexpensive. You can usually get these for about $30, but of course it's only one focal length, 135, but it is a little bit faster. It does go as fast as 2.8. And again, it is manual focus because it is a vintage lens. You're adapting to it. There's no electronics in this to control anything. Um, it's just a, a nice vintage lens. So if you're interested in not spending money, I would highly recommend you look into vintage glass because you can get some really nice lenses like these for under $100. This one especially, uh, because this is the Celtic line, which was considered a budget line for Minolta. But essentially, it was the same lens as their Rocker series, which was more expensive. Um, it just didn't, it was just kind of rebranded. Okay, on email, we have Colm O'Gara from Ireland. Hello, Ireland. My question is, I have a large digital camera, DSLR style, but unfortunately, it has no mic input. And I would really like to put an external mic on it. My camera has a mini HDMI port. Um, first of all, that mini HDMI port is not going to help you. It's going to be an output which connects to an external monitor or a television or what have you. Um, and if you don't have a mic input, there's no way you're going to get a microphone into that camera unless you were to hack the camera somehow and create your own mic input. However, even if you could do that or if somebody else could do it for you, you would not be able to control levels on that camera because the software in the camera is not made to run levels on sound. So you're gonna to have to rely on automatic gain control, which sucks, and so that's not gonna help you at all. What I recommend is just biting the bullet and going with double system sound, 
which is going to sound better. Double system sound, you have an external recorder, you plug your microphone into that, you record your sound, then you sync your sound and picture and post. It's not that difficult and your audio is going to be way better than if you could get your microphone into your camera anyway. Dedicated audio recorders like the Zoom H1, that's what I use, are made to record sound. They're awesome. The electronics are better. They are designed specifically for this purpose, unlike your camera, which is made to record pictures, not sound. So even a camera that has a mic input is going to have a cheap preamp in it and is not going to be at the same quality as this. So yes, you do have to sync it in post, but it's not that big of a deal considering what you get in the end. If you want superior sound, which you should, right? And sound is very, very important. Just go with double system. Next up is Graydon Cochran who says, is there a place for camcorder based filmmaking or do you need to have a DSLR to be successful? Great question, Graydon. Um, you don't need to have a DSLR to be successful. However, you do need to know the differences between the two because just because camcorders are kind of passe in the film world as far as you know, independent micro budget productions because everybody's into DSLRs, that doesn't mean they are not worth their weight because there's some things you can do with a camcorder that you can't do with a DSLR. And mostly I'm talking about zooming. If you're a big fan of zooms, Every camcorder, it seems like ever made, comes with a motorized zoom lens, and there are no zoom lenses on DSLR cameras. They're interchangeable lenses, vintage glass, whatever. You're not going to find a way to zoom that lens. Yes, there are zoom lenses, but they're not motorized, and you'll often lose focus if you try to zoom manually. If you ever try to do a fast zoom, it uh, doesn't always look that good. If you could find a way to do it smoothly, or if you could even find a lens that holds focus while you're zooming, please tell me about it, because I'd like to hear more about it. Um, but camcorders is very easy to do a motorized zoom. They have that rocker switch, which you can do different speeds, and uh, that's really awesome. Now, of course, a camcorder also has a smaller sensor, which means that most things are going to be in deep focus, uh, opposed to a DSLR, which has more control over shallow depth of field. However, I recall a guy named Orson Welles and Alfred Hitchcock uh, did a lot of things with deep focus, and their movies turned out okay. I admit I'm a big fan of being able to change lenses on my camera. I like my still camera uh, primes that I use, my Minolta lenses. Gives you a lot more control over the image than I think that what a camcorder would give you. However, if a camcorder is what you have access to, and I know you, you have one, you have a Canon XA10, I think you say, that's a good camera. Shoot a movie with it. There's no reason why you can't shoot a movie with that and take advantage of that zoom lens. Let's say you want to do the vertigo shot, for example. You can easily dolly in and zoom out using a camcorder, but just try and do that shot with a DSLR and uh, you won't be able to. So it, the, each camera has advantages and disadvantages, just like anything. Um, but I would just say, you know, take the camera that you have access to. If you don't like the camera, borrow a different one or find a DP that has his own camera or whatever and just shoot the movie you want to shoot. But don't let the fact that you don't have access to any specific kind of camera or gear whatever stop you from making your movie. If you have your movie set up and you only have access to a camcorder, a good camcorder like you apparently do, use it. And finally, we have Ray Rack who says, do you consider yourself a video photographer or more of a video production person? In other words, what do you consider your specialty and where do you see your journey taking you? All right, a lot of questions there. Uh, right off the bat, um, video photographer or videographer, I think is commonly the term, or video production person. I'm definitely a video production person. I kind of see videographers as shooting weddings, shooting events, uh, things like that, guns for hire, corporate videos, that kind of thing. I've done that kind of stuff, but I definitely consider myself a video production person or a filmmaker where I like to tell narrative stories or I like to do things that I've come up with. As far as my specialty goes, I think I'm a halfway decent editor, but I probably enjoy directing the most. And that's something I'd like to develop. Uh, I really enjoy being on set uh, on a film shoot. Uh, I like working with actors. I like working with the crew, with the DP, and the AD, and whoever's available, whoever's there. Uh, I really like the familial atmosphere that's created uh, during the, the, the film shoot. I think it's just a really great experience. And yes, it's stressful and it's hard. But, you know, pre-production is all about planning and everybody's not involved with that. And post-production is all about editing, which can be a real grind. But when you're on that set and when you have people that are passionate and have worked with you to bring your vision to life, it's really, really exciting. It's exciting to hear actors speak the words that you've written and modify them and change them and see them evolve. And it's great to have people like design props and costumes and bring them. Even if you're designing the props and costumes and bring them to the set, it's cool to see them, you know, take place on camera or be used in a in a certain scene or whatever. It's just a really cool experience. So I really like that and that's where I would like to go as far as developing my abilities is in a directorial direction. Um, and to answer your last question, where do I see my journey taking me? Uh, I definitely want to make a feature film. I definitely would like to do that here in Alaska if possible. Not sure if it's going to happen or not, 
but it's definitely on the bucket list. It's something I've always wanted to do ever since I've been interested in filmmaking, right? Everybody's inspired by the movies they've seen their entire lives. And if you're a filmmaker, you want to do something like that, like something you see on the big screen, um, at least at the 90 minute mark. You know, that's something I like to make those 90 minutes to be qualify as a feature. Even if it doesn't go anywhere, it's something that I would like to really do. However, there's something that I've always wanted to develop as far as, you know, where is my journey taking me? Well, I've always wanted to develop internet specific storytelling. And what I mean by that is that the web really is just a delivery device for old media forms, film, television, uh, music, books, all these things have existed in the past and the internet came along and it just became another way for these things to be delivered to the, the world. And that's great. But I've never really seen anything that you could only get on the web as far as storytelling. It's always other forms that have been shoehorned onto the web. So what I think would be cool is if you took something kind of like a video game with the interactivity removed, and I realize that Im immediately sounds lame, but think of it this way. Imagine if you had all these pieces of a story in front of you, say like on a website, and they consisted of visuals like it could be text, it could be video clips, it could be artwork pictures, whatever, and you have audio and all different, all different media forms that are all telling a story. It's almost like an evidence locker or a crime scene. And you have all these different pieces of the puzzle. And if you view them individually or absorb them individually, just like you do in a video game, a story would then be made manifest. Although in a video game, you're kind of led by the nose with cutscenes and all that explaining what the story is. But in this idea, which I'm calling kind of jigsaw storytelling, is that you take all these different pieces and you can absorb them at whatever rate you wanted to, whether it was you know watching something on the bus or doing you know while you're doing the dishes or before bed, since the internet is kind of an ADD medium anyway, so you can take these little pieces and then as you absorb them all and maybe discover new ones along your journey, and once you get all the pieces of the puzzle, the story is then made clear. But it's not you're not told what the story is; you realize what the story is. And to, to me, that's kind of interesting and definitely more challenging than you know, more contemporary linear storytelling. And it could only take place on the internet where you could have like a website uh, with all these little pieces sitting in front of you and then you could discover them and absorb them and research them or look into them. I think that could be a really cool storytelling form. And that's something I would definitely like to pursue in the future. I'd like to thank everybody who wrote in. I really appreciate your comments and questions. And I get a lot of good questions every week, so keep them coming. And if you'd like your question read on the show, please send me an email to thefrugalfilmmaker at gmail.com. That's your best chance you have of getting your question read on the show. Or you can comment below, or you can send me a message on Twitter at frugalfilmmaker. Now, this week is Thanksgiving, so I'm not exactly sure when my video is going to hit, but it will be there. And then a Q&A will follow on Monday, so we'll see you then. Yes, it's built right in and you can't change it, but you can 